great to see everyone here and practicing safe distancing. So, uh, we will continue to have our services at 9 and 11 a.m. and we ask that if you would be so kind to constantly let us know what services you're coming to so we can keep a record of that and also any event something happens we have a, a way in which to monitor what's going on. It, it's wonderful that we can once again serve the Lord. I know uh, this past week in federal government uh, in New York changed the rules uh, from 25 to 50 percent but we are going to stay at the 25 percent for now uh, so just keep that in mind let us uh, come to the Lord together in prayer father we thank you we thank you for your love your goodness to us thank you for our church family you watch over us, protect us, guide us. We ask now that in everything we do, everything we say, everything we think, that you would be honored and that your name would be high and lifted up. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Good morning. The pastor asked me if I could uh, finish a little bit today. And I was thinking about a verse that I've been reading. And one of my favorite passages of scripture is, is John chapter 11, the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And I know I've spoken on this before. I think even in this church I've done it before. But the Bible is really an amazing, amazing book. Um, have you ever had the experience where you are reading the scripture and you read a passage that you've read 10, 20, 30 times and all of a sudden it speaks to you in a marvelous way that you really have never seen? It was like, wow, it's just like God will, through the Holy Spirit, will open up a passage to us. And that, that was the experience of, of this passage for me uh, a few weeks back. And so I thought I would share a little bit today on John chapter 11. In this thing, Mary and Martha are the active. Uh, Pashatir, either was already dying or soon to be dead. Um, and we see their relationship with God. And I see it, it comes out in basically three questions that they asked Jesus. The question they asked him, uh, more or less an exact phrase. And uh, then we see Jesus' answer. So I'd like to look at that. And question number one that we're going to have is I'm in need, can you help? I'm in need, can you help? We see that in John 11, verses 1 through 6. Uh, I'm going to be quoting some of these verses, but I'm going to be skipping some as well, too. But John 11, 1 through 6 says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who was anointed the Lord with appointment and wiped his feet from her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, and he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Okay, the situation is pretty clear. Um, Martha and Mary are suffering. Uh, they are really, really distressed. And in a time that we're in, we have a lot of people distressed or suffering. I know a friend of ours whose father died in a nursing home some time back, and she couldn't be there with him. There was a suffering. They're suffering of all kinds of financial heartaches, etc. But they're really fearing for their brother. And they watched him struggle with this illness. And uh, they sent word to Jesus and basically said, Lord, he who you love is ill. They had nowhere else to turn. Whatever they were doing wasn't working, and every day he was probably getting worse and worse and worse. So they decided the only person who could help them was Jesus. Now, in that passage we just read, Jesus um, gets this word, and he doesn't drop what he's doing just to go tend to Lazarus. Instead, he says, this sickness was not unto death, but it is for the glory of God. And he stays two more days in that place, and such, where he was sitting there. And in short, Jesus' response to Mary and Martha's question is, can you help, is, yes, I can help, and I will help. But I'm doing it in my way, my timing, for the glory of God. We can read this passage and feel pretty much probably what they felt at the time, that why couldn't Jesus come running and give this little thing? We really want God to respond to the illnesses and the pains we have. And so in this time of suffering, we have a tendency to want Jesus to act and act now. Um, it's almost like saying Jesus is our own personal genie in the Bible and stuff like that. But Jesus stays these days, and in moments of suffering, you and I can want God to solve that problem for us now. In moments of despair, in moments of confusion, nothing we want more than God to just solve that problem now. And I get that, because I feel that all the time myself. And if God is good and, and, and all-powerful, well, why shouldn't he just solve our problems like that? But the truth is, God is not a genie in the Bible. Uh, he, he, Jesus is going to be the king of glory, and he acts the way he wants, when he wants. But the important thing to take out of this passage is not that Jesus didn't get there right away, but a number of things. Just because Jesus, God, doesn't show up when we want him to, or Jesus then, doesn't mean he isn't listening. It says very, very clearly that Jesus heard the request from Mary and Martha, who he just our request to times of trial. Second thing is, 
experiencing of pain and suffering doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. God does love us. You can see it specifically says that he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Jesus loved them. So he loves them very much. So in our pain, in our time of struggle, whatever that might be, we have the confidence that's shown here in this verse. Even in our mind, pain, we can know that Jesus loves us. Also, it doesn't mean that even though we're in pain, that God isn't in control. He's in control of everything. Jesus was in control of this situation. Uh, he was in control of Lazarus' illness and the illness that was going to take his life. And the same is true for us today. Even though we sometimes walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have God with us and we know that God is in control. It doesn't always feel that way, but we know that God is in control. The other thing I think you get at that first lesson there, the first question there, is pain and suffering doesn't take away from the goodness of God. God, Jesus is going to do what they're asking for, but he's going to do it in a way that they could not have seen coming. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that has all kinds of struggles around the COVID virus, justice issues, concern about civil unrest, people having lost their jobs. Uh, and it's a very troubling world. But God exists in that world that He is good. He is there. The old thing we know, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. That applies in times like us too. So the first lesson is can He help? Can God help? Yes, He can, and He will. He doesn't always write our script. We, we have to listen to how God is going to do this. Which leads us to the second question. The second question comes up in a couple of verses ahead. And the question is, I'm mad. Where were you? Where were you? This comes in John chapter 11, verses 17 to 23. It goes on some more, but I want to read those passages. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console their brother concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection of the last day. So she puts this demand to God. She, she's putting that there. And she acknowledges that God, that Jesus has the power here. But she can see she really wants him to act now. Jesus had waited two more days before he even got up and came. And sometime in that period of time, between when he got up and left, and when Martha and, and Mary, Mary went, they watched him die, they watched him fade away, and they buried him. As they're grieving, they hear that Jesus is on the way. And Martha runs out to a continent to just get in touch with him, find out what's going on. She asks that question, you know. You can see by the way she's coming out at once to him, she's probably angry. Uh, she's angry because Jesus, in her eyes, was too late. He was too late. You know, it's natural for us to um, really be bothered by uh, the things that go on in our lives. Uh, but the important thing is that this thing of why didn't you solve this problem is the primary tool of Satan in our lives. If you're so, your God is so special, why didn't he do this? If your God is so wonderful, why didn't he let that happen? Whether it's you know, the death of a loved one, or an illness, or a loss of a job, or any one of the number of things. Um, that is where Satan is going to track us and stuff like that. But people, she's angry. She's venting her anger on him. The most interesting part of that passage when she goes at him like that is Jesus doesn't seem to be bothered by her anger. There's no sense of rebuke to her. There's no sense of anything else. Just sort of the teaching that he takes. And that tells us today that when we feel pain and suffering, it's okay to ask God, what are you doing in this guy? It is okay to ask him that. Um, so in our moments of time, we can see this right here in Scripture, Martha is doing that. There are whole passages of Psalms called laments, where people lament why it's going. And God gives us the grace to express those in us, express our sorrow, our pain, even yes, possibly our anger. Jesus was gracious to them, but not coming down on them at that time. 
But there's another side to that. We have to give Jesus the same purpose. We have to say, yes, we know we fall upon you, we know we hurt, we need you to respond. We've got to hear what Jesus is going to do. Jesus does respond to Martha. And he, by offering something, he offers truth. Your brother will rise again. He says that to her. A little later on, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So basically, he's telling Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. He's the future come to death now, and he is going to turn all the things that's turned upside down, right side up. So Jesus declares that the pain and the suffering and the loss she had, he's going to change that. Maybe not then and now, but he's going to tell her, he's the holy. He's the life. He's the one who, who will reverse the curse of death. He's the one who will make all things that are wrong right. He's the one who will destroy the sin of death. And he's the one who will turn the world right side up. At that moment in time, when she is despair and angry, he offers the truth. He doesn't necessarily change what has happened or how Martha feels, but what he means to bring is comfort and hope. He brings hope. But Jesus speaks to Martha and to Mary as well. In her pain and suffering, he reveals that he's their light that's going to take them out of the darkness. He's their hope that's going to take them out of their hopelessness. And he's their breath that they're going to give them. We can feel that same way today. Jesus is our hope. He is the resurrection. It's going to see that. So we have a situation where Jesus now is answering the second question. But there's a third question. The third question says, I'm hurt. Do you care that I'm hurt? This is in John chapter 11 again. I'm going to pick up in verse 30 to 35. If you want to read this later, the other verses in, in between are good too. But these verses say this. Now Jesus had not come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had, had met him. When the Jews who were there, who were with her, saw her in the house, consoling her, and saw Mary rise quickly and go out. And they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus, Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved, and his spirit greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Lord, do you care? Jesus, do you care? This is Mary's turn to approach Jesus. She's been in the house, and she had gotten word from Martha that Jesus is on the way. And we can hear her grieving now, too. She seems to be grieving a little differently than Martha did. Martha's grief seemed to be an angry grief, uh, whereas Martha seemed to be more like a broken, desperate it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. We all grieve in certain ways. Some of us do get angry. Some of us do just feel broken. Some of us like to try to stuff it all down and pretend we don't feel at all. But you can see the pain here. Mary literally falls at Jesus' feet. And he said the same word that Martha did. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a cry of anguish as opposed to anger. In the depth of disparity, death of a situation like this in their life. We now see one of the clearest pictures of God descending into our misery and into our depths to express how much he cares. What does Jesus do when uh, he sees these people in pain and their suffering? Jesus wept. The shortest and very profound verse of the Bible. What does Jesus do in our times of suffering, of pain, of confusion, of doubt, of anger, whatever it is, what does he do? You know? He doesn't pity us in that. He doesn't pity you. Right? He identifies with us. He sympathizes with us. He empathizes with us. He knows our trouble and he feels it, our grief and our pain, the suffering that we have. Jesus too feels of it in a very special way. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just feel our pain and join us in our pain and respond to our pain in a very supportive way. He does what is now different than any other religion on the face of the earth. As it relates to pain and suffering or anything. 
Jesus not only goes into that grief and, and sorrow that we have, identifying, and sympathizing, and empathizing with it, he goes to redeem it. He goes to redeem that and reverse it through the resurrection. Now, he's, like I said, deeply moved and troubled by the pain that goes on. And, and he goes, and Jesus says, let's go to the place where Lazarus is. And he does go there. And the people go, he says, roll away the storm, take them all the way down. And he calls out, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And come out he did. Sometimes when I read scripture, I like to say, what must have felt like there at that time to see that? What would Mary and Martha have felt? How would Jesus, raising Lazarus from the dead, strike us? Well, I think what we're seeing here is mourning that is in terms to praise and dancing. Sadness is going to turn into gladness. Hurt is going to turn into happiness. Darkness will turn into light. Sorrow turns to joy. Weeping turns to singing. And grief turns to glorifying God. All that is there for him. And it's there for us too. It's there for us. He is still the God who is here to us in our time of grief, in our time of sorrow. And we know that one day he will do what he did for Lazarus. All those who call him and all those who love him and all that are saved by him, we will experience that rebirth and that coming kind of back. Does Jesus care? He absolutely cares about what we go through. And he cares so much that he did something about it. He didn't just say, oh yeah, I'm with you on that. He did something about it. The resurrection came because Jesus was there. And it was a time where um, he was not only giving the, the picture of what was going to happen as soon if he was going to be crucified and, uh, and rise from the dead, but it's a hope for the future that we're going to see that too as Lazarus saw it, we will one day see it for all our loved ones. But that's why also other passages of Scripture refer to this. Paul does in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As I said, there's a lot of pain and suffering in this world. And there always has been COVID-19 and some of the justice issues or the law and order issues and people out of work just exacerbates, makes even worse this thing around us. And people all over, Christians and non-Christians, are trying to understand, trying to make sense of what's going on. They're trying to say, all my plans, all my dreams, all my intentions, they're faded away, I can't do it. But we as Christians have a different standard. We are just as suffering, just as embedded in the problems of today. But we are different because there's a time when Jesus is going to change everything. Because of his death and resurrection, he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Revelation 21.4 is the verse that speaks clearest to this day. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death sh shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any anymore, for the former things have passed away. That is the promise we have from Jesus. Does Jesus care? Yes, he does. Does he love us? Yes, he does. Does he respond? Yes, he does. Always not in the same way. So the question we have today is now what do we do about that? It's, it's all good to know that this is a lesson we can take to heart and we can how do you apply this to act in our own lives and say, how do we respond to a God who has done that for us and will continue to do that for us? Well, let me just tell you a story. Some years ago, when I was working here in New York and downtown in Manhattan in the financial district, one afternoon I was out at one time and down in the plaza near Wall Street, there's a place where people would congregate and do things, and there was a juggler there. He was a guy that was trying to make a living by juggling. He had a little basket in front of him that he could put money in. When I got there, he was taking these balls and throwing three balls up in the air at a time. 
And I watched him do that, and um, it wasn't really impressive to watch him throw three balls. Back in that day, I tried it, and I was able to do that. I think my eye-hand coordination is faded now, so I'm not going to try to do that as an object lesson here. But uh, I was watching him do that. And he was doing it, he was watching it, he was talking, in general, like, he didn't have a care in the world. And then, for a quick second, he just turned and looked briefly at a young woman standing there who was his assistant to this thing. He just turned and looked at it briefly and looked right back, and she reached out and she threw him one and two more little balls. And so now, five of them are going up and down. That was a little bit more impressive to watch five of them going up and down. He did a while longer, kept doing it, and, and then all of a sudden they get that quick little look at the, at the girl and sister again. And she throws him two more balls. Now he's struggling, struggling nine balls. And now I'm watching him, and this is starting to get impressive. He's really doing a pretty good job on this. But he didn't stop there. He did it for a while, another quick look at the girl, and this time she shows him, throws him two more things, one after the other. But they weren't balls, they were little bats, baseball bats, about that long. So now he's juggling seven balls and two baseball bats at the same time, small ones, understandably. Now I was really amazed by it. So he went through his act and he was talking like, he just happened to be walking down the street talking in a general act thing, talking about the weather, talking about everything else, while he's juggling nine balls and, and two bats and stuff like that. Then he got to the point as well, enough of this. And quick as a flash, he caught one of the bats, banged the ball over to his assistant. Then another one caught the bat, the bag of his system, <clears throat> and then he did all of them, batted all the balls over to her again to finish. And that was why he took his bow. He had caught them all, juggled them all, batted them back, and everything was there. I watched it and I was, I was kind of amazed. It was really amazing to see. <clears throat> but then I watched him a little bit longer. I, my head was spinning, watching everything flying up in the air, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I was way higher than the ceiling is here. And I was watching, and I was like, how in the world are they doing that? But when you looked at him briefly, he was only watching it, the next thing coming down. He wasn't watching him. any of the others, except the next one that's coming down that he had to grab. Everything was separated, and then he grabbed that next one. And the second thing I noticed was, not only was he skilled, that young woman that was working with him, she was skilled too. She was throwing it to him in exactly the right spot and exactly the right way. You can imagine if he throws the bat is facing in the wrong direction, everything goes wrong. So it was a situation where he was focusing only on that. And he was having her, skilled as she was, well, do her part of this thing. And I thought about that and I was thinking about it, it came back to my mind uh, when I was looking at the passages. It's kind of an example, I think, how we have to react in an environment where everything's out of control and our pain and suffering is there. There's some lessons in the juggling. Lesson number one is focus on the thing you have to do now. Focus on the next thing. Don't watch all the balls flying around. Focus on the next thing you've got to do. In a time when there's so many things going on, decisions to be made, and people we need to help, and things we need to do, and, and everything, just have to focus on the next thing that God wants us to focus on. So that is the, the other thing is he was nothing without that assistant of his. He couldn't have done any of this. That tells me, you know, our time of grief, go ahead and lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's who we are and that's what we do. Lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ and let them help. She was there quietly, never saying a word, never doing anything, except being there to help him. And that's something we could learn to do. And the third lesson I think I take from that thing is in the same way that gravity controlled what was going to happen to make sure that the ball or the bat was right where he needed it to be at that point in time. God is in control of everything we have. When I watched it, it was all about it was flying every which way. But it was in control and gravity was doing that. In our sorrow, we can respond the same way. God is in control. We can know that and we event on a day by day basis. So the juggler's lesson to me is more of an object lesson. I take that uh, as I do from scripture and I say, okay, I'm going to do what you call me to do right now. Because it's overwhelming to me to try to, you know, should I do that? Should I wear a mask? Should I go there? Should I go to the doctor? Should I do any one of a thousand things? The people 
my job, do I like this problem, etc. Just basically say, take it one step at a time. Take it one ball at a time. Do what you have to do. Trust that you can get people around there, or brothers and sisters of Christ to help you, and trust that God is in control every bit as much as the gravity is in control of all those objects. The lesson I have from these three questions, the lesson I take from it, is that we can always know that God is there. Even when we are hurting, we know He's there. Even when we don't understand Him, He's there. And His answers go far beyond just patting us on the back. It's he's going to solve all those problems. The day will come when all those troubles are going to be taken away. It doesn't always feel like it moment by moment, but this passage of Scripture tells me that it's there whenever we need it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege we have of opening your word to us and just letting your Holy Spirit speak through that. We know that you indeed are the God who can and does help us and sustain us and support us. We know that you are with us even when it doesn't feel that way, and even when we seem so broken hearted. And we know that you care for us in the worst of circumstances. And you care for us more than just consoling, but the deep down into our hearts you are with us and you as we are in the death and resurrection of your son. Give us hope for the future as well. By the way, we go from here as a kind of people who are willing to just put our cares and trusts on you in this time of difficulty and sorrow. May we be rejoicing, not because of what's around us, but because Jesus Christ holds the answers to all that we have before us. In his name, amen. There's one more song. to last. Thank you.